Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, it's good to be here, I think. <laughs> we'll see how this goes. I think next week I'm preaching on politics. Is that what you get? Yeah, okay. Um, let me just get situated here. <laughs> I want an honest show of hands. And you need to be honest. How many of you are really glad you're not standing here right now? <laughs> okay. Okay, good. Okay. Just got to ease the tension a little bit. Um, it is really great to be with you. Uh, this topic, as you'll see, is something that's very um, dear to my heart, has uh, changed my life in, in, in more than one ways. And so anytime people want to uh, dive into this conversation, I'm, I'm excited. And I, I guess you don't really have much of a choice. Well, you had a choice to come to church, so I guess, you know, you, you didn't sign up for it. But uh, I'm really glad. I, I'm sure there's lots of people here who are very interested in this conversation. It's probably very close to maybe your homes, your friends, your family, or to yourself. And uh, with that, I do want to just say, for those of you who um, are attracted to the same sex, maybe you're wrestling with your sexuality or gender, maybe you haven't even told anybody yet, I just want to say I'm so thankful you're here. Um, God loves you, God values you, and he's very, very excited over your mere existence. And so I hope you feel that uh, this morning. I know there's going to be different viewpoints on this topic. I mean, there's no way you can gather in a room this size and not have some differences of opinion. And so, you know, maybe you're kind of nervous coming in, like, is this person going to agree with me? Is he going to say all the right things? And um, let me just say this. My goal here is not to, not to, like, convince you that you should agree with me on everything. I, I know that's just not going not to happen in one message, but... I do think we could all have the common goal of leaving here this morning doing two things. Number one, thinking more deeply about this topic and loving more widely. Thinking more deeply and loving more widely. Um, I'm going to share with you kind of just how I even got into this conversation. We're, we're, we are going to dive into the Bible, but most of all, I, I, I want us all to think more deeply and love more widely around a topic that in the church hasn't always demonstrated deep thinking or wide love. It was about 10 years ago when I um, started getting into this conversation, and over the last 10 years, I actually met several people along the way that have really uh, influenced my thinking. These chairs represent several people that I've come across along the way in my journey. Um, this first one is, uh, is Kevin. Kevin is a, a gay man in his uh, early 50s. He's married to another man, been married for about a decade. Uh, Kevin is not a, he's not a very religious person at all. In fact, he, he kind of can't stand Christians. And anytime he gets a chance to just, you know, rail on the church and rip on the church, he will take that opportunity. And, and Kevin's the type of person that can make some Christians really, really upset. Why are you so angry at us? Why are you always slamming on the church? And he hates the church, and the church hates Kevin. He would be what some of my maybe relatives might call, the, oh, look, there it is, another angry gay activist. See, there you go. They just hate the church. That's Kevin. This is um, my dear friend Tom. Tom is a pastor. He's in his early 60s. Um, he's married, married to a woman. Uh, has a few kids, several grandkids. Uh, he's actually very uh, conservative theologically and, and politically. He's in a conservative church. He's politically conservative. I'm, I'm, I mean, kind of like MAGA conservative, okay? Like, not that, you know. Um, <clears throat> but Tom has been exclusively attracted to other men his entire life, and nobody knows about it. And he's faithful to his wife. It's not like he's out, you know, running around, sleeping with guys or anything. Like, he's, he's again, theologically conservative, doesn't believe in, uh, uh, doesn't believe in same-sex marriage. He's faithful to his wife. He's a wonderful father and, and grandparent. And I said, well, wait a minute. If, if this is just something you're, you, you struggle with, you're, maybe you're tempted by, but you're not, you know, acting on it, and, you know, you're not being unfaithful to your wife, so why, why do you have to keep this a secret? He said, Preston, if I simply told my church that this is a temptation that I have, even though I'm, I'm, I'm submitting it to Jesus, I would be rushed out of that church and fired on the spot. This is my dear friend, Leslie. Uh, Leslie, um, I met Leslie about 10 years ago, and uh, she shared her story with me. From the time she was 
three, four years old, wrestled with what psychologists now call gender dysphoria. Just, just this, this agony that she has over being a, a female. From the time she was four, just had this distress that just overwhelmed her. She just assumed as a four-year-old she would end up growing up and, and just becoming a boy because everything about her being just felt like she was or should have been a boy. Also, from the time she was four or five years old, madly in love with Jesus. Just, just wanted to follow Jesus with her whole heart. So, so she grew up just with this wrestling of having this, this thing that, that people didn't even have a name for back then. Wondering why she is carrying around this body that just doesn't feel like it fits with her. And then also being madly in love with Jesus. Um, unfortunately, as she got older, those two experiences didn't mesh well together. I'll come back to Leslie's story in a second. This, is, uh, this chair represents Maddie. Maddie is a lesbian in her, in her early 40s. But uh, when, when Maddie was nine years old, her dad took her by the hand led her down into the basement, brought her into the bathroom, and then he chained her to a toilet and left her there for three months. Three months later, he came down, unchained her, grabbed her by the face and said, Maddie, I'm so sorry that I did this to you, but if you tell anybody about it, I will kill you. And then he proceeded to rape her for the next four years. Maddie says today, no man, no, no man will ever, ever touch me again. I'm not suggesting that her abusive past is the reason why she is a lesbian. I am saying with every single human being, there is a story. There is a background. And every time I think about that, you know, forwarded email I get in all caps, it's always in all caps, about the dangers of the gay agenda, they're after our kids. I always wonder what Maddie thinks about those forwarded emails. I wonder if she thinks, where, where was the church when I was a kid? Where were the Christians when I was being harmed by my father's agenda? Behind every human being, there is a story. I want to look through the person into the story that lies behind them. This is my friend Matt. Matt uh, grew up in the church, uh, uh, conservative church, from the time he was a young age or young teenager, really started to uh, pursue Jesus with his whole heart. Um, but also from the time he was, you know, 13, 14, 15 years old, realized he was also, you know, exclusively attracted to other guys. And man, he, he tried to pray it away every night. He got, you know, begging God, take this away, take this away. He would, he would wake up early and memorize verses thinking, you know, maybe if I memorize enough verses, it'll, it'll make this temptation go away, but it wasn't going away. And so he, um, comes before God and says, God, I, 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 I when I read the Bible, I, I don't see how it's going to be okay for me to engage in a same-sex relationship. And so unless you're going to change my desires, I'm going to commit my life to celibacy. And in he's, that's the path that he's been on. But at 19 years old, he, he came to his elders. He was volunteering at a church and serving in, in the youth group. And, and um, he came to his elders and just thought to himself, well, I, I should probably at least tell my elders kind of just the full story, kind of what, what, I'm, what I wrestle with. And so he came to his elders and said, hey, I just want you guys to know um, I'm, I'm gay, um, but I just, I also want you to know that I, I firmly believe in the church's doctrinal statement. I'm, I'm not engaging in a same-sex relationship. Like, I'm actually committing my life to celibacy. And as he tried to explain himself, I, I think the elders were hung up just on the term gay, and they jumped in and said, well, Matthew, we can't have anybody at our church with your lifestyle. And he thought, well, like, you don't, you don't allow celibacy here? Like, what's the, like, what, I don't, and then another elder jumped in and said, well, surely we can't have you around our kids anymore. And he's like, oh, oh, uh, uh, no, I'm not a pedophile. I don't struggle with that at all. Like, I... And in that moment, I think those elders are very well intended, but sometimes language, language itself can be utterly dehumanizing when you're just talking past each other and you're not quite understanding what somebody means by the terms they're using. This is Eric. Eric is uh, very similar to Matthew, uh, raised in a church, grew up in a, a somewhat small town in, in, on the West Coast. 
a uh, conservative town, and uh, like Matthew, you know, he, from the time he was 13, 14 years old, started realizing he's attracted to other guys, and, and people kind of were, you know, they kind of thought he was gay, you know, and so they would make fun of him, they'd mock him, and um, tease him, and, and finally it got so hard that he came to his parents at 15 years old and says, Mom, Dad, I, look, I, I think I'm gay, um, but I just need to tell somebody. And they said, well, we can't have an abomination living under our roof. And so they kicked him out of the house at 15 years old, wandered the streets, homeless for several years until finally at the age of 19, it got so difficult. And he ended up taking his life, becoming a well-known statistic of teenagers who are gay, who are kicked out of the house and end up not making it. Yeah, I, so I put these chairs, I, I need the tangible reminder that this conversation is about people. We, we just have to, if, if you're here and you're not gay and this is not your experience, we need the constant reminder that we are talking about a diverse range of people. You know, I think of someone like Kevin. Kevin can, can really get under, under your skin, and he will, and he, and he knows it, and he, he, he kind of likes to get under your skin. And people, you know, often say, Kevin, well, why are you so angry at the church? You know, that's actually a really good question, but, but let's change the tone. Um, Kevin, what, why are you? Why are you angry at the church? I'm genuinely curious, like, what, what's behind that anger? And if you ask Kevin that question in good faith, he will say, well, see, you know what? Eric was a friend of mine. In fact, I've had several Erics in my life. Gay people raised in the church who end up either being kicked out of the house or maybe ending their life. And so I'm very, yes, I'm very angry at the church because from his perspective, the church is killing my friends. If you were Kevin, how would you feel about the church? I think about Tom, my dear friend. Tom is one of those beautiful, loving people I've ever met. He has shepherded his people like crazy. It is amazing to see how much he just loves people in his church. In fact, here's the, here's the irony of it all. <laughs> he said, you know, what's, you know what's funny, Preston, is I've actually had several people in the church come to me scared, sweating, you know, like they're teenagers, and they'll come to me and say, hey, pastor, I need to talk to you. I haven't told anybody this, but I think I'm gay. I, I know you don't understand what I'm going through, but I just need to tell somebody. And Tom's like, oh, wow, yeah, help me understand what that's like. <laughs> I do long for the day when the church would be there for people like Maddie. When Maddie, when Maddie thinks of the church, she would think of this, this community of Jesus followers that is just bubbling over with love and kindness. I just, I just wonder, like, what, what, what could the church have have done in that situation, if, if they had known what was going on? Would she see the church as a beacon of love and grace, or would she simply see the church as yet another abusive organization? So I, I look, I, 10 years ago, I didn't care about any of these people. 10 years ago, I, you know, so I, I was raised in a conservative Christian environment, um, it was, it was a good, it was actually a really healthy con, uh, church environment, um, but I didn't, I didn't know any gay people. I didn't care about the topic of homosexuality, but, you know, 10 years ago, somebody came to me and said, hey, you, you, you seem to like controversy. <laughs> you can Google me later. Um, you, you should write a book on homosexuality. And I was like, why? Like, Bible says it's wrong, the end. Like, it would be a, a one-page book. <laughs> But then, I, you know, I was teaching at a Bible college, and so I was getting some questions from younger, young, you know, college students, and, and they were asking really good questions, like, well, where does it say that, and what about this, and what about this, you know, person that says something different, and what about this person, what about, and they're pushing me on a little bit, like, well, well, do you know for sure? And I said, well, actually, I don't, because I just always assumed the Bible said blah, blah, blah about homosexuality, it's wrong, you know, and that was it, but I've you know, I've never actually looked into it for myself. You ever, you ever had those moments where you know what you believe, but not why you believe it? And so I said, okay, I, I'm going gonna, 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to understand what the Bible says about this. So I got all these books and commentaries and, and dictionaries, and I just wanted to comb through the whole Bible and, and, and understand what does the Bible actually say about homosexuality. But early on in my, in my you know, scholarly journey, I, I looked up from my books and I was like, you know what? <laughs> I don't have any gay people in my life. And when I'm studying something that's ultimately about gay people, like that, that might be... I might need to fix that, but here I am, a, you know, I, I'm teaching at a Bible college, I'm, I'm living in a, in a pretty cr- Christianized town, like when you go to Starbucks, everybody's reading the Bible, you're like, gosh, I gotta go to like a dive bar to be around, you know, non-Christians or something. Um, so I'm like, all right, you know, I'm homeschooling our kids, or, you know, so I'm like really insulated with, you know, my Christian environment, um, and so I, you know, I, I'm sloppy, I don't know what to do, but I, I, I just, I, I, I wanted to get in the lives of gay people so that I could humanize this conversation. So I'd, you know, meet somebody and say, you know, my, my, my name is Preston, I'm, I'm a Bible college professor, I'm studying the issue of homosexuality, and you look gay, can I b- buy you lunch and hear your story? <laughs> people are like, <laughs> like what? That's descriptive, not prescriptive, you know what I mean? Like, don't write that, that's not, I'm not saying that's good. I'm just saying, like, I, I just didn't know. I was so ignorant about so many things in this conversation, but I truly, truly, truly wanted to simply hear people's stories full stop. And the people I started meeting didn't believe me. <laughs> like, yeah, right. Wait, you're a Christian? You just want to hear my story? <laughs> yeah. I've never met a Christian that was kind to me, is what some people would tell me, let alone just want to hear my story. What's, what's your real angle? No, no, I'm serious. I just want to hear your story. Long story short, man, I, I would sit down with person after person after person simply to hear their story. And several things happened. Number one, my stereotypes were just obliterated. You know, when, when you're not around actual gay people, you, you, you just have the stereotype that's been fed to you, you know, well, all gay people are just like this, they all have an agenda. And I met some of those beautiful, wonderful people that no longer were just a object of study, but became my friends. And in the midst of all the diverse stories, there was a common thread woven throughout almost all of them, and it went something like this. Well, you know, Preston, I was, I was, I was raised in the church. I grew up in a church. In fact, I was a, a, an Iwana champion in 1992. I still have the, the, the vest with all the patches, you know, whatever, the sword drill, right? Got saved at summer camp every year. <laughs> I said, well, what happened? How'd that church experience go for you? Well, yeah, mm, didn't really work out well. well. Well, tell me about that. How, what, why didn't that work out well? And story after story after story, what I heard was not a scenario where this person grew up in the church and was, was surrounded with loving people who dignified them, humanized them, and then they, when they came out and said, you know what, I think I might be gay, I'm really wrestling with this, uh, my sexuality, I'm trying to figure out, what, okay, what does the Bible say? And people lovingly and graciously said, well, here's what the Bible says, you know, but hey, we will walk with you, we, we, will, we will love you, we'll be here for you, and if, 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 if it comes to where you just don't really want to follow the Bible, we will still love you. Like, we're not, like, we can have that disagreement, but we want to help you on this journey. I, I've never actually heard somebody tell me that kind of story. My friends were mocked and ridiculed. Or, or they would just overhear the silence. <laughs> Sometimes silence can be really loud. Or they would overhear nothing but the negatives. It's wrong. Repent. Boycott this store. Protest that. Forward this email in all caps. Negative, negative, negative. One of my friends who grew up in the church says, to be gay in the American evangelical church is to be dead. You're an outcast, an orphan, a refugee, a diseased person. My other friend, uh, Leslie. Leslie. Okay, so Leslie... Uh, who grew up, again, with gender dysphoria. When, when, when Leslie was a teenager, 
She remembers her pastor preaching a sermon series on homosexuality. And this is how Leslie recalls that sermon. She says this, My pastor began a sermon series that included all the evils of homosexuality. He condemned all homosexuals to hell. God had no forgiveness for such deviance. Even worse was the mentally ill trans community. These people were an abomination to God's eyes. In God's eyes, we must protect our children from their evil ploys. My friend, and my friends, Leslie said, my friends were shouting amen and showed the appropriate levels of disgust. And I was ashamed that I was such an abomination to the God that I adored. Not that she was like shaking her fist at God and God's shaking his fist back at Leslie. Leslie's like, I love you. I want to follow you. Whatever it takes. I, don't, I, just, I, I want to live my life for Jesus. And what she's hearing is that that's impossible because she is intrinsically unwanted by this God. And so I asked Leslie, what did you do in that moment? She says, well, I went to the pastor I went to him after, went to his office and said, hey, here's my, here, I'm wrestling with this, this I feel like I, I'm carrying around the wrong body, I, I, I'm attracted to the girls, I don't know what to do with that, and, and, but I love Jesus, what, what, what do I do? And the pastor opened the back door of his office and said, I want you to leave my office right now, leave this church, and I never want you to come back here again. And she didn't, Leslie never stepped foot in a church for another 18 years after that. You see, we can, we can get the Bible right. Or let, let, me, let, me, let me say that stronger. I'm a Bible professor. Like, that's, that's, that's what I do. Like, I, I love the text of Scripture. I believe if, if God, the God who breathed the stars into existence breathed out his word, then we have no other option than to follow what God says. Full stop. So we, we need to get the Bible right. But if we get love wrong, we are wrong. Because truth and love are not at odds. If you are not being loving, you're not being truthful. And if you're not being truthful, you're not truly being loving. And, and I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about um, uh, love the sinner, hate the sin. Okay, you've heard that phrase before? Yeah. I used to like it. I used to, actually, I, I used to really like that phrase. It was on my refrigerator for a while. Not really, but. And, until years ago, a gay friend of mine said, okay, Preston I, Preston, I got a question for you. Why is it always a straight Christian using that phrase towards gay people? Why is it always one directional? <laughs> like, straight people, those of us who are you know, attracted to the opposite sex, like, well, we got it all figured out. Like we're, sit, we're standing over here in our, in our ivory tower of glowing with straight, straight righteousness, you know, and look, looking down at all those poor gay people like, oh, you know what, you sinner, I, I hate your sin, but you can thank me later, but I will love you anyway, you sinner. I love you, but I hate your sin. Try that in a marriage relationship. Honey, you're such a sinner, but it's okay. I will love, I hate your sin. But I, I will love you anyway. It just has such a condescending, self-righteous scent to it. Instead of love the sinner, hate the sin, let's love the sinner, hate our own sin, and invite other sinners toward, to walk toward the only one who is without sin, because at the foot of the cross, we are all broken in our sexuality. And so we need to approach this conversation with that kind of humility and addiction to God's grace. Because we are all in need of it, equally. Or as Paul says, I love what Paul says in Romans 2, 4. It's the, it's the kindness of God that leads to repentance. I, I long for the day when, when the church, and I don't mean this church. I mean Big C Church, general church, churches in general. I long for the day when the Christian church in America has a rep reputation of just radiating with kindness. Not, not slack-jawed, you know, niceness. I'm talking theological kindness, the kindness that God showed to us through his son, Jesus Christ, who looked at us and said, you are a sinner and that's why I love you. I came to seek and save the lost.
Most, at least in my experience, gay people, trans people, when they think of the church, they typically don't think, church? Oh, kindness. Again, not just, not theologically anemic niceness. I'm talking embodying that radical, scandalous grace of Jesus in a world that is longing for that. So this is where some people end up walking out, so I'm glad most of you are here. I saw a couple of people go to the bathroom. Hopefully they're coming back. But <laughs> so, th- so this is my journey, okay? And, and here I am, Bible college professor, love the scriptures, but man, I'm, I'm being disoriented by, by the stories I'm hearing, the people I'm meeting, and, and it drove me back to the text of scripture to say, have we gotten this right? And, and I, before you and before God, I... To the best of my ability, I revisited what the Bible says about same-sex relationships, same-sex marriage, um, as fairly as I possibly could have. Read as widely as I could, you know, people on all different viewpoints, and I came to the conclusion that I do think the Bible teaches that marriage is between a man and a woman, and that all sexual relationships belong within that covenant bond. As, as I read the scripture, scriptures, this seems to be clearly taught in the Bible. Now, now I, I call it the historically Christian view of, of marriage. That, that's, that's the phrase I use. Um, and now I want to explain to you why I believe that. I don't want to take a, a, a ton of time here for the sake of time, but I don't, I don't like to just state my conclusion. I want to show people why I believe what I believe. Okay, so um, I'm going to assume... Lay of the land here, most of you are probably going to agree with what I'm going to say, but if you don't agree, uh, I, I offer this as my best understanding of what the Bible says. You can disagree with that, you know, um, but I, I just want to show you why I think the Bible teaches this. Uh, under three general points. Number one, when the Bible talks about marriage, it, is there like a little, oh, I don't know how to get rid of that. Is that annoying or is that okay? All right. Hopefully an email doesn't come up. You do not want to see my inbox. So that's a little worrying. But anyway, we'll go with it. Um, Okay. When Scripture talks about marriage, it says that sex difference is is part of what marriage is. This this is, by the way, I would say the most important, in terms of the theology of what the Bible says about marriage, you know, in conversation with whether same-sex relationships could be considered a, a... a marriage. I think this is a really, really important point. When Scripture talks about marriage, it says that sex difference is part of what marriage is. I mean, there's, there's different definitions of marriage today. Like when you say the word marriage, it's almost like you need to follow that up with an actual definition of what you mean because the word marriage in the English language can mean different things to different people. Some people say, well, marriage is just a, a, a consensual union between two humans. If you're not harming anybody, um, it's consensual, then it can be a marriage. And that's, that's one definition of marriage. Another definition of marriage would say, no, I mean, marriage is a union between people with different, of different biological sexes. And a marriage is the coming together specifically of people of different biological sexes. I, I do think that that second understanding of marriage is what the Bible says when it talks about marriage. I'll just give you a couple uh, examples here. In Genesis 2... Genesis 2 is where we have the famous marriage passage in uh, Genesis 2.24. For this reason, man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And this is, I mean, and this isn't debated. This is, you know, in, in Judeo-Christian tradition, I mean, Genesis 2.24 is like the fundamental marriage passage of the Bible. It, it's like the foundation uh, you see it quoted in the New Testament. You actually see it quoted in other early Jewish writings around the time of the New Testament. Um, what's interesting about Genesis 2.24 is that it kind of begins in mid-thought. For this reason. It's like, well, what reason? It's like if I came to you and said, hey, hi, Bob. Sorry if your name's Bob. Um, for this reason, da, 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 like, whoa, whoa, did I miss something? Like, like <laughs> I missed, you got to go back and like, give, me, give me what you were saying that leads to the statement for this reason. So for this reason connects 224 with 223, where the man, Adam, says, this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. This is a beautiful statement of equality. 
that he's looking at another human being who is a lot like him, who is, I will say, equal to him, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So this, you know, so he's looking at this other human being that's a lot like him, but this other human being is also kind of different than him. Equality and difference baked into one. For this reason, man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. This one flesh union that we now call marriage, it does seem to be not just two humans, but two sexually different humans coming together. Uh, Jesus says something similar in, uh, in Matthew 19. Matthew 19, he's in a conversation with uh, some Jewish leaders, and he says, at the beginning, the Creator made them male and female. And here he's quoting Genesis 1.27, where, where God created us in his image, male and female, he created them. He, so he quotes Genesis 1.27, and, and then he skips to Genesis 2.24, and he says, for this reason, only here this, this, this phrase kind of connects, instead of Genesis 2.23 to Genesis 2.24, it connects Genesis 1.27 to 2.24. Is this okay? It's too early? You got coffee? You following? Okay. This, this is as deep as it, okay. If you're like, ah, I'm losing. Okay. This is, it's all, we're going to come up for, some, for, for breath here in a second. Okay. Again, follow the logic. God made them male and female. For this reason, man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife. And the two... He actually changes the wording a little bit. Instead of they, he specifically says the two, like the number two. Jesus can do whatever he wants. He's Jesus. So that's, I wouldn't recommend changing the Bible, okay? But he, he adds the two shall become one flesh. He's actually, okay, he's, not, he's using probably a, a, a different translation of the Old Testament of that day. That's a whole other lecture. Don't worry about it. But the point is the two are specifically two sexually different Persons. Like he goes out of his way to quote a passage that describes sex difference and then he splices it together with the fun, most fundamental marriage passage in the Bible. Okay, so when scripture talks about marriage, it says that sex difference is part of what marriage is. And again, I, again I, I, I'm just trying to, for you to see how I'm reading scripture, okay? But ultimately, I mean, you got to kind of decide for yourself whether you think this is a fair reading or not. Okay, number two. When scripture talks about, actually, I'm gonna skip that quote. Um, it's a good quote, but we gotta keep running here. When scripture talks about same sex sexual relations, it always uh, prohibits them. Like, whenever the Bible explicitly mentions same sex relationships, it always prohibits them. Now, I do wanna add a few footnotes here, though. There is a debate about what these passages mean. Okay, do you know, so Bible study method, like, what, the, what does the Bible say? What does it mean? How does it apply to, to today? Kind of the three movements of Bible study. You just, you know, what does it say? What does it mean? How do you apply it? When you ask the question, what does it say? Well, it says same-sex relationships are prohibited. What does it mean? Well, what kind of same-sex relationships? Are the ones back then the same as today? Um, is there any, you know, issue with, like, the translation here that we need to talk about? The, there are debates about the meaning of these passages. Now, I've, you can, you know, I've, I've, I've written on this a lot. And I, I do think these passages are talking about same-sex sexual relationships categorically, not simply a certain kind of same-sex relationship. Now, Here's something else to consider that uh, sometimes straight people don't always uh, think about. Look at the context of these verses. I mean, you can't see it here. Just go on, on your spare time. Go, go, go look up the surrounding context, and you will see that all of these passages are embedded in a larger context that condemns all kinds of sins. In fact, in fact, if you look at Romans 1, and read the rest of Romans 1, it is like five more verses after this, and you will see that Paul lists about 29 different sins, uh, some of which were committed by you, some of you, before coming to church today. <laughs> I'm serious, go read it. Like it's, it's, Paul leaves no sin unturned in, in Romans 1. Like the whole point of Romans 1 is for us to read it and say, oh my word, Oh, I so need God's forgiveness. 
which is the whole point. Because Romans 1, you know, he lists all these sins, and then it's almost like you, you have the, the moral person saying, yeah, go get him, Paul. And then Paul turns around in Romans 2 and says, all right, let, you, you and me need to have a conversation. <laughs> you're doing all the same things that all these people are doing that you're condemning. And then finally we get to Romans 3, and, and we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, which is the whole point. So we, we cannot read even these passages from a position of judgmentalism, a superiority, but from a position of humility and grace. God, thank you for being the only one without sin that we can follow. Thank you for forgiving me of my sin. With that posture, we, we still do recognize that when these passages do address same-sex relationships, it always prohibits them. Number three, third reason why um, I believe in a historically Christian view of marriage is that um, there, there has been a remarkable global, historic, multi-denominational 2,000-year agreement on what those, these passages mean, what Genesis 1 and 2 means, Matthew 19, the text I just cited. Because some people can say, well, Preston, you're, you're just... You're just a, you know, straight, white, homophobic person. You don't realize it, but you are, you know, and you're just, you're reading into the Bible what you want to see. And that, that's a legit, that's, I, 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 I hear that. Like, that, that's a legitimate accusation that you are reading into the text what you want to see. But this isn't just my reading of Scripture. This is the way the global multi-ethnic church has read it for 2,000 years. I'm not, please hear me, I'm not therefore saying it's correct, okay? I, I don't want to, you know, some people will just punt to tradition. Well, we've always believed this, so let's not revisit it. Nah, I'm a Protestant, I'm sola scriptura, uh, I am reformed and always reforming. We should always take tradition back to the text of scripture. My, my whole point in bringing this up is this isn't just some isolated reading. It's just not just a few Christians who are reading it this way. This has been the global consensus for 2,000 years. And, and I, it, you can cast that net as broadly as you want. Protestant, Catholic, Greek Orthodox, Coptic Christians, Russian Orthodox, Christians living in Africa, Latin America, Asia, wherever Christianity has existed. This is how uh, Christians have read the text of Scripture. You, you can look at different expressions of the church, high church, low church, reform, Wesleyan, Frozen Chosen, Presbyterian, snake handling, charismatics, KJV only fundies, and those who think the message is a, is a translation. <laughs> Like you, could, you, I mean, and think about the diversity here. Like you have some, you know, pot smoking, beach preaching, you know, surfer out in California. They are there, and then you have some Greek Orthodox incense swinging priest in St. Petersburg. You could, I mean, are we of the same religion? Like they, there's so much diversity in Christianity. In fact, we can't even agree on what books belong in the Bible. <laughs> we agree on hardly anything within Christianity, but. One of the few things we have all agreed on is that when we read what the Bible says about marriage and, and same-sex relationships, you know, it says the marriage is between a, a man and a woman. So those are three of the main reasons why when I revisited Scripture, I, I, I do think Scripture um, teaches that marriage is between a man and a woman and that all sexual relationships outside of that are considered uh, sin. Uh, and again, if you're like, ah... I still don't believe it, then I, I am not here to convince you otherwise. Again, think more deeply, love more widely. I just want to be honest with here's how I understand Scripture. Now, let me go back. <laughs> uh, and, and if I've given some of you ammunition to go in an argument, please don't. Um, I rarely see people argued into the kingdom of God or argued into seeing things the way you see them. Has that gone well for you? When, you, when, you're, when you're in a heated debate about, I don't know, who to vote for or something, and, and you just like pile on all the evidence. Does that ever work? Especially if you get kind of loud and angry and aggressive. Like, does that, does that ever go well? <laughs> My friend Leslie, when she was told not to come back to the church, she ended up getting involved in the LGBTQ community, she found, she had to, I hate even saying it, but she had to leave the church or got left from the church to find love and acceptance in a new community. 
And uh, several years later, she ended up falling in love with a woman, and uh, they ended up getting married. Her, uh, her wife's name was Sue. They were married for about four or five years, but um, Sue, her, Leslie's wife, had a, a rare disease that, that caused her hands to shake really bad. And one night when Leslie was doing the dishes, Sue went out to light a cigarette, and she was shaking so bad that she ended up lighting herself on fire, and she died. Leslie rushed outside, saw her wife up in flames, rushed her to the hospital. Obviously, she was alive for a couple more days, but after what the burns were so severe that they had to pull the plug. And so Leslie now has a funeral on her hands. And so what does she do? Well, he calls a church. Hasn't been to church in 18 years. Calls a church, happens to be a really conservative church, and... Uh, the pastor answers the phone, actually, and Leslie says, hey, my name's Leslie. You don't know me. I don't know you, but my wife just died. Would you be willing to do her funeral? And at that moment, she was expecting, like, best case scenario, I'm just going to get hung up on. Worst case scenario, I'm going to hear a lot of really dehumanizing Things right now. Wait, your wife? What are you? What are you? Some kind of queer? We're not going to have some gay funeral. How dare you come? That's what she was expecting. And instead, without hiccup or hesitation, footnotes or fine print, the pastor leans in and says, I would be honored to do this for you. Wait, your, your wife just, I am so incredibly sorry. You must be grieving, right? I'm so sorry. In fact, if it's okay, we. We will take care of everything. We'll take care of all the details. Um, if you need food, if it, like, what do you need right now? We would, we would love to come alongside you in this horrible moment. I can't imagine what it would be like to lose a loved one. I would, Leslie, I would be honored to do this funeral for your beloved Sue. And at that moment, Leslie says, it was like the scales from my eyes fell off. I saw a glimpse of the Jesus I read about in the New Testament who didn't need to agree with people to love them, who, who didn't need people to be on the same ethical page to be around them, who didn't need people to agree with his sexual ethic for Jesus to enjoy them. Jesus, Leslie came to Christ in that moment, and uh, that was 10 years ago, 12 years ago. I've, I've met few believers as passionately in love with Jesus as Leslie. You know what Leslie does for full-time job is helping other kids, especially kids, but anybody who's wrestling with their faith, their sexuality, to see the beauty of Jesus. I've seen, I've seen Leslie stay up until two in the morning talking kids down from suicide. Kids who are in churches who are so scared to death to say anything, they don't know what to do. And some of them think that ending their life is the only way to go. And Leslie will... will Talk to them and say, give it one more day. It gets better. Give it one more day. I will be with you. I will be with you all night. Just don't do it tonight. Jesus loves you. Jesus wants to be with you. Jesus values you. Even if you don't feel valued by other people, even if you don't feel valued by your family or, or Christians or whatever, Jesus is overjoyed every time you wake up in the morning and he wants to see breath in your lungs. Give it one more day. You see, Leslie is not just needy. Leslie is needed, <laughs> and the church looks more like Jesus Christ because Leslie is a part of it, all because a pastor had the courage to say, I would be honored to do this for you. You see, our truth will not be heard. Our truth will not be heard until our grace is felt because the greatest apologetic of the truth is love. Father, we thank you for loving us, for pouring out your grace on us. E even when, when we absolutely did not deserve your grace, your forgiveness, your love, Lord, you passionately entered into our lives to forgive us of our sin, to give us the very power to walk a life of repentance, Lord. My single prayer this morning is that we would all embody that same radical grace 
to those around us. In Christ's name, amen.